The swirling floods rising every minute until they've engulfed every building they haven't washed away. Water surging through the streets, tearing at the buildings, the homes, the shops. For if floods bring tragedy, they also highlight the Australians' courage and tenacity. It takes a lot of bad weather to provoke slow-flowing Old Man Murray into aggressive behaviour. And even then, a Murray River flood is more a creeping blanket of water than a flash flood torrent. It's all due to our geography. With our wide, flat land of Australia, the earth initially soaks up the overabundant flow. But then, like a sponge, it fills and spreads out and out, forming lakes the size of inland seas covering anything in its way. Citrus blocks, vineyards, farms and pastoral grazing lands. That was the scene in mid-year 1956, as the ancient lowlands along the River Darling and River Murray were succumbing to the greatest flood of our time, deluging town after town as a flood peak made its way to the sea. Flood-prone towns and communities knew weeks or months ahead it was coming, but how high would it be? The last big flood was back in 31, but people said this could be bigger. Old timers came forward with knowledge of the 31 flood. They gave advice and showed where banks had been built and also brought out photos of the time, which gave us new fighters an idea of where to start and what to do. Important state-owned infrastructure was at serious risk. On water's edge sat power stations and pumping stations that must be kept operating. Without them, the towns wouldn't survive. Local engineers at the critically important Mildura and Redcliffe's power stations kept alerting head office in Melbourne there was trouble brewing. Maintaining electricity was crucial. Without power in the districts, hundreds of pumps would fail, creating an even greater disaster. With drains and sumps now acting in reverse due to floodwater pressure, pumps were being used to remove sewerage that no longer went down pipes and drains. One wet Melbourne Sunday evening, I arrived home to find the SEC Chief Civil Engineer waiting in the lounge room with my ticket for the first plane out of Essendon Airport next morning. He said the power stations at Redcliffe's and Mildura were in danger of being flooded by waters of the Murray River rising at the alarming rate of one inch per hour. When I got there, I worked from the Monday morning until midday on the Wednesday before finally sleeping. At Mildura Power Station, we made a raft for the engineer to go out by cable to the pumping station out in the river. It was very difficult with the swift movement of the river and twice we nearly lost this headstrong Dutch engineer who was hell-bent on being a hero, much to our dismay. We even had to place heavy steel girders on the top of the concrete pit that was meant to protect electronic equipment to stop it from floating away. A critical stroke of mechanical luck came to the flood fighters in the form of a tractor. The little grey, massy Ferguson tractor that fitted nicely between the rows of tree and vine. Fortunately, the TE20 could perch atop a levee bank while it was being built. Light enough to ride over the sandbag heights and tough enough to survive the occasional dunking in the water. They were fitted with multiple attachments, earth scoops, forklift attachments to raise the sandbags, and trailers to transport the soil to build the banks. Fortunate indeed. As an engineer, I was fairly new to the Redcliffe's pumping station and the workings of a close farming settlement such as Redcliffe's. On the first day, I looked up towards the cliffside store to see literally hundreds of people arriving with tractors and trailers, all armed with shovels, all headed for the main gate of the SEC power station. Rain had been falling steadily during the morning and was now heavy and becoming quite miserable. The SEC staff had arrived and were trying to get some organisation out of the rapidly developing chaos when around the corner arrived a utility loaded with rum to warm the masses, courtesy of the Redcliffe's Club. The Salvation Army came out at night and gave us hot pies to eat in the freezing cold weather and rain. Unfortunately, 
We all developed terrible indigestion due to this diet and were forced to eat lots of quickies. The community response became a local military-style operation, something that came naturally to the thousands of World War II soldier settlers, Aussie diggers who'd been given development land along the river. Joining them were thousands of European migrants, the so-called New Australians escaping the aftermath of war. Now, they were about to face a slow-moving common enemy, the bringer of wealth to the region in good times, now threatening life and property around every turn. Many people evacuated their homes and were taken to the Muldura migrant camp, where flood evacuees were stationed. Half the camp's population of over 200 people during the flood period came from Wentworth and District. Around the town, a number of men were allotted to each section to patrol its banks. Sirens were placed at the town hall and at the post office, and sounding of the sirens and the number of blasts would indicate to the town where help was required. Rapidly dawning on river folk was the reality that this was a flood of epic proportions, not a single flash event, but months of high water, sweeping away man-made levees, undermining major infrastructure, the pump stations, locks and weirs inundating and wiping out the rich fruit bowls of Victoria and South Australia. Whilst the floods were rising, we tried to maintain a cash flow by moving vegetables by boat and by devising a flying fox. It was difficult and dangerous work. I well remember Brother Jack taking a full load of bagged pumpkins across Boyle Creek. He was swept against a stump and the boat overturned, pumpkins floating away. Only a few bags were saved and no boat. Lucky we were both strong swimmers. Another day, this mermaid suddenly appeared out of the water. My wife had swum the swollen, steadily flowing, snake, snag and insect laden floodwaters to tell me that the government was considering allocating flood-free lease land to those who had been flooded out. And was I interested? Local communities banded together in a massive human response. The greatest peacetime mobilization of men and women working along the river's length for half a year. A voluntary military operation to build levee banks from anything they could find. Sandbags, tree stumps, car bodies, using their bodies at times to stem the wildcat breakout. In 1956, my uncle lived at Kerwa and remembers picking oranges and grapefruit from boats. He had a big boat in which he would go from the levee bank, towing smaller boats in which they would then climb into to go around the trees. His mum and a friend soon learnt how not to go in circles and to row properly. The Murray-Darling catchment covers 1.06 million square kilometres, 15% of Australia's landmass, and an area the size of France and Spain combined. It plays a crucial role in supporting Australia's economy and rural life. This river system is a lifeline in a dry continent, feeding water from the subtropical north down the Darling River and from the eastern snowfields where the Murray starts as trickling streams, 2,500 kilometres from its final destination at the ocean near Goolwa in South Australia. Incredibly, while this was a growing national disaster, it made few serious headlines around the major eastern seaboard cities. They were busy. Bureaucrats and politicians in the cities were aware of a flood, but largely ignorant of the serious threat to communities and the economy. At the flood front, it was action stations. At the first sign of flooding, Wentworth's emergency service swung into action. Bulldozers were called in, sandbags came from more than 300 miles away, and the town was surrounded with levee banks. Volunteers worked 24 hours a day in shifts, building and patrolling banks. Boats were made available to evacuate the town, and air rescue plans formed if any one of the banks should give way and the entire town be flooded. One of the centres of flood activity was the Wentworth District Hospital. Men worked for weeks with tractors building levee banks to prevent the hospital being flooded. Wentworth was an island in an inland sea. Extremely long delays occurred on all trunk calls. Even calls to Muldura had four hours delay, which meant they had to be booked. Many times people could get to Muldura by car and back to Wentworth in time to cancel their call. This was a people's army of many languages, men, women, grandparents and children, 
working side by side against the swelling tide of Australia's greatest river as it grew slowly out of control. I was eight years old when the 1956 flood was on. When the flood was heading towards our house, my mother sent my stepfather off to hire a truck to bring out all our furniture and possessions. Instead, he took the money and headed for the hotel and got drunk. Mum was in hospital with the newest baby and she came home from hospital in a taxi to collect us. We were the last people left on the riverbank and looking out of the back of the taxi, I could see the bank burst and the water was chasing us. We just made it to the bitumen. On a lighter note, another memorable incident was when we three bikes launched our boat with our valuable Aberdeen Angus bull tied on behind. And we were also trying to move 60 head of cattle across flooded uh, creeks and the odd piece of dry land. It took us nearly all day to achieve that, but we did. One of our local characters said, when the flood had passed, he was going to drive his Fergie into the pub. And that's exactly what he did, with drinks all round. My wife used to take the Fergie and drive across the paddocks to the uh, back road to pick up any mail or bread. And the kids went by boat to a pickup point to go to school. They saw heaps of big brown snakes and there were hundreds of rabbits and roos isolated on small islands. Floodwaters moved down the Murray and Darling rivers for seven months, costing 30 million pounds in lost agricultural production and damage in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. That figure in today's values is about a billion dollars, but doesn't include human suffering and loss of endeavour. In those days, personal suffering wasn't assessed as being nationally relevant. With today's knowledge, the flood was truly a freak of nature, a convergence of multiple unusual events that triggered an incredible scenario. Scientists generally agree it was a one in 100 year flood. However, flooding along the Murray River is also a natural phenomenon upon which a number of major environmental benefits depend. The wetlands, floodplains and anna branches of the Murray River floodplain play a fundamental role in supporting rare and threatened species and plant and animal habitat of special significance. Floods replenish wetlands, transport food supplies and play an important role in the life cycle of many plants and animals. But how did it happen and why? In the western districts of outback Queensland, rains were plentiful and excessive. The Darling River near Wentworth was going into flood. A thousand kilometres away, heavy rains were falling. Three months earlier than usual, in the highlands catchments, the snowy mountains in New South Wales and Victoria. Record floods on the Murrumbidgee combined with Murray River flows. The Darling River flood peaked about four to six weeks after the Murray River flood peak meaning river levels were high for a much longer period. Usually during Murray-Darling floods, the waters in the system spread out below Tokem Wall in New South Wales to engulf the Edward and Wakul rivers, forming one huge lake, which then controlled flooding further downstream by acting as a natural reservoir. But this time, the natural basin ran over and over. As you can see from this flood marker at Lock 11, flooding occurs regularly along the Murray River. There were numerous floods in the early 1990s, but that was nothing compared to the 1 in 100 year flood event in 1956. From town to town, block to block, Usually silent, swampy backwaters became massive, swirling lakes. As these filled, the rolling wave continued downstream again in a human battle, sapping time and energy. The cemetery being on the hill was our saviour. It was like an island. My husband was the church sexton and helped with funerals. The minister would hold a little service before my husband and the undertaker would take a small rowboat towing the coffin across the large expanse of water. My husband had to dig the hole and then go home and get dressed in his grey coat and row over for the service and then row back to the cemetery. 
was taking so much time that our four-year-old boy and I would get busy and fill in the hole and we'd have it just about filled by the time he came back. We had a bit of a shortage of sandbags at one time, so I sent off a telegram to Rotary Clubs in Victoria and some in South Australia. When I got home from work that night, a whole heap of sandbags had already been dumped opposite our shop, which was sent up by the Portland Rotary Club. After that, clubs sent them from everywhere by rail and this was a terrific help. When the local crisis had passed, we gathered all the spare bags and sent off two semi-trailer loads down to Renmark for their time of crisis. This shows how the river, swiftly overflowing its banks at Renmark, Bere, Cadell, Wakery and Morgan, spread over the surrounding countryside, inundating thousands of acres of valuable land and threatened whole townships. Even today, South Australia records the flood of 1956 as the state's greatest natural catastrophe. The state depends on the river for drinking water in dry years, delivered through pipelines to Adelaide and the north of the state. If pumping stations were knocked out, industry would grind to a halt at the iron city of Wyala. Its flood peak was 12.3 metres at Morgan. It breached all man-made levees and wiped out major winery and citrus production regions for years. I was an Adelaide journalist when I arrived, there was a great stretch of water in the whole valley. There were various plans to evacuate people, but it was a constant state of tension and alert. The remorseless Murray crept up the main street of Manham to unimaginable heights. The river drove up drain pipes and exploded in geysers in streets. It was night that everybody dreaded, because the river would start to infiltrate. Some of the outer banks went, others nearly went, but were saved by the crash crew. They were the commando force, ready to be rushed to anywhere the bank had weakened and was ready to break. The river was sly and treacherous. I knew as the days passed and the river peaked and the fight was won that I had been covering an epic of human endeavour, one I never forgot. Crossing the river with the ferry was very hazardous because of the debris. Tree trunks, branches, boats, shacks, water tanks, petrol drums, anything. I had to stay operating so that motorists were able to get back to Cadell. The water was lapping the causeway by the time the last vehicle crossed. Then I was provided with a launch for future crossings. The Wakery bank manager made the crossing once a week with his cash strongbox and his pistol which he stuck to like glue. On Sundays, up to five denominations of priests and ministers had to make the crossing. Luckily, they agreed to cross together, which assured me of my entry into heaven if the worst should happen. The river eventually peaked at 31 feet at Cadell, and the ferry was out of commission for three months. Renmark was a remarkable island in the floodwaters, held together by an army of volunteers. We heard all the water from the Murrumbidgee, the Darling, and the Murray was joining in one hit. We were in for a granddaddy of a flood. As a citrus grower, life just stopped in that interim period of three months. In the end, we worked on 20 k's of flood bank surrounding Renmark and the settlement to protect it. Without the banks, Renmark would have washed downstream. No floodlights, no lights. It was winter, it was pitch black. Peak flow was 341,300 megalitres per day in mid-August 1956. This was sufficient to fill Adelaide's Mount Bold Reservoir seven times each day. Total flow to South Australia for 1956-57 was 48,225,000 megalitres, enough to supply Adelaide for 250 years at the rate of consumption in 1956. Leaving the low clay and sandy flats awash, the Murray entered limestone regions where the ancient river had cut deep through rock to form sheer cliffs. There was only one way for the water to go, upwards. Towns considered safe from the waters were now victim to the unexpected. <laughs> 
I was nine years old. When the water started rising, all our household furniture and goods were placed on planks supported by 44 gallon drums. The floodwaters rose to the roof of our house, but my aunt and uncle's new house collapsed from the force of the waves, which undermined the walls and the timber and roof washed away in the floodwaters. These days, I'm an accountant, and I must have shown some aptitude in those early days, because when the tourists came, I charged them two shillings each to row them down the main street of Manham in one of my father's boats. My neighbour, who was the baker in Manham during that time, often told his story. The local fire chief had come into the bakery and had said, there's been a break in the levee, and so, he slipped on his knee boots, took two steps down and found he was well up past his knees in flood waters. They had had yeast and, and dough all on trays as they were making buns. They just had to empty everything else out and let it float off in the water. I do recall him saying that the bottom hotel had about eight feet of water through it, but the pub was operational. They would row their boat up to the top balcony where they had a hole cut in the railing and tie up their boat. <laughs> the early high bravado of battle on the levees and community one for all spirit was coming to an end. After the flood subsided, there was very little government assistance. People that had been on the floodplain at Marook at the packing shed were battling for some relief to rebuild. That's when everything got political. Who got what? Who got compensated? Who was in the paper? Who wasn't in the paper? All those things started to come out of the woodwork when people have had a chance to sit back and breathe and toss it all over. There was bitterness in every town over who did what and that sort of thing. For a time, I think the 1956 flood built up community spirit. Even the enormous Lower Murray Lakes, Alexandrina and Albert, rose by almost a metre and in the flat grazing lands to the east, water infiltrated up to 40 kilometres inland, cutting major roads to Melbourne. The complex barrage system designed to back up the massive water storage for navigation were useless as the water stirred towards the sea. Meeting it head-on was the tidal surge of the Southern Ocean. Along the battered river's edge, recovery was slow. Houses and businesses were still in ruin, and small communities suffered from the inevitable stress of loss of property, stock and cash. Incredibly, the death toll was said to be four lives. No one will ever know the full community cost, the early demise from tragic loss, the mental strain on families, but for wide-eyed youngsters sharing the adventure of driving a Fergie tractor, toiling with adults, it was a badge of courage, a rite of passage that helped make a stronger person. Many became the future of the river, with the gritty character to face the challenges of a river under stress from man-made disasters with far more long-term impact than a one-in-100-year flood. <laughs>